Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Costas Panos. I'm a professor of electrical engineering and computer sciences at UC Berkeley and director of Citrus and the Banato Institute. And as the co-chief scientist of the C3.AI Digital Transformation Institute, it is my pleasure today to introduce our seminar and our speaker. I see that people are gathering, so I would like to uh, first say a few words about the Institute uh, that uh, I'm sure that uh, it is new to, to most of you. We just started a few months ago. But C3.AI, uh, Digital Transformation Institute, our mission is to attract the world's leading scientists to join in a coordinated innovative effort to advance the digital transformation of businesses, government, and society. So this is a very big agenda, and uh, we are glad to have put together an impressive team of institutions to help us accomplish it. The Institute is being sponsored by the C3.ai and by Microsoft, and we have uh, several academic institutions that are participating. University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, University of California at Berkeley, Carnegie Mellon University, MIT, Princeton, the University of Chicago, and Stanford University. We're also joined by, by the, the <clears throat> National Center for Supercomputing Applications at Illinois and the Berkeley Lab that are, that are contributing both resources and energy to make this happen. So the seminar that you're attending is part of the series. Some of you might have attended some seminars before. It happens every Thursday, roughly every Thursday at one o'clock Pacific, Pacific, uh, Pacific time. And you can see here that after today's seminar, which I will be introducing in a minute, we have an exciting sequence uh, of presentations by distinguished speakers across our ecosystem. You can see that the many of the seminars are focused on the present crisis on COVID-19. And this is not uh, a coincidence. Uh, we have run a big call for proposals a few months ago. We have funded uh, some very promising ones, and many of the presentations are by people who have been who have participated in these calls, and we are now working on projects that this institute has been proud to fund. So we welcome you to be attending this as this series unfolds. And you can see that we have a very uh, busy agenda agenda going through the end of the calendar year, and we we'll keep adding presentations coming in the near future. So with that, I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about today's presentation. Uh, for those of you who are attending this for the first time uh, on this online format, after this brief introduction, we'll have a 40 minute presentation by our speaker and 15 minutes will be left for Q&A. Now, those of you attending as participants, you, can, you are welcome to use the Q&A. In fact, if you see a question that has already been asked, if you like it, you can avoid it. Uh, we will try to answer as many questions as the time will allow. And uh, hopefully we'll have a lively conversation at the end of this uh, presentation today. Now today's presentation, of course, uh, is extremely important and very topical. Uh, we heard a lot about, uh, of course, the present pandemic. I mean, the news are, are was with that uh, for, the, for the almost the last, you know, uh, 10 months now. But uh, we also heard a lot about uh, issues of fairness in applying machine learning and AI techniques. And if you put them all together, if you put the two together, uh, we have a very important problem to address, the problem of improving the fairness and equity in COVID-19 policy applications. I think it's gonna be quite exciting. But let me now uh, uh, turn to uh, introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Raid Ghani. Uh, Raid uh, is uh, a distinguished professor in the machine learning department at the Heinz College of Information Systems and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University. This is where I got my degree a few dec decades before he did. Uh, he described himself as a reformed computer scientist and a wannabe social scientist. But he's focusing on large scale AI machine learning data science applications to solve the problems that really matter. Public policy, social challenges in a fair and equitable manner. He works with governments and nonprofits on policy, in health, criminal justice, education, public safety, economic development, and urban infrastructure. 
He's passionate about teaching, which is the right thing to be passionate about these days. And he's focusing on, on teaching practical data science and he started the Data Science for Social Good Fellowship that trains computer scientists, statisticians, and social scientists to work on data science problems with, with social impact. Before joining CMU, Raid was the founding director of the Center for Data Science and Public Policy, a research associate professor in computer science, a computer fellow at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago, and most interestingly, the chief scientist of the Obama. To uh, I would like to welcome today's speaker, and I would like to invite him to start the presentation. Okay, thank you, Costas. Um, thank you for the very uh, uh, exaggerated introduction. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Let me share. Um, do I the have to stop sharing myself first, but let me find. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, so what I thought I could do, um, yeah, so my name is Ryan Ghani. I'm at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and and this talk is really going to be at the intersection of, you know, the, the two logos uh, on, on my cover slide, which is uh, the logo for the public policy school and the machine learning department, which is, which is where um, I'm based. And, and that's very similar. So I just joined CMU about a year ago from University of Chicago, which is again, where I was in both of those places in public policy school and computer science. And I find sort of this intersection being a, um, a place where I think we need a lot more people uh, at this intersection. Um, people who care about um, the world, people who want to do, you know, make, make a social impact, make it in a, in a way that's positive, um, but do it through the, the skills that a lot of um, people like us have, which is in you know, tech and data and machine learning and all the, all the wonderful buzzwords uh, that, 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 that we're uh, around today. So, so that's the intersection I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, talk about today and, and specifically focus on um, where machine learning is being used today in, in public policy. And, and when I say public policy, just sort of, even though I have capitalized the two Ps, I actually mean public policy with, with generally with small Ps. We're not, we're not designing macro global policies. We're really doing much more tailored, individualized, personalized policies. Um, and, and, and that's where, you know, tools like machine learning and AI are, are really sort of much more beneficial um, then in kind of doing doing kind of macro analysis. So I'll start with some examples before I jump in of, of where we've been using, you know, machine learning to kind of tackle social social issues. I'll start with a project that actually we started um, a few years ago um, that was in Kansas, in Johnson County, Kansas. And, and, and if you're, you know, familiar with the criminal justice system in our country, it is totally broken. Um, this, these numbers that you see here are just for jails. Like this is not prisons. This is just local county jails. 11 million people go through jails every year. Um, horrible. Um, the depressing numbers are the bottom, right? The two thirds them suffer from mental illness, substance abuse issues, all sorts of other things. And so this work was um, Johnson County saying, coming to us and saying, uh, we would like to reduce the rate at which people come back to our jails. And a lot of the root cause we think is mental health issues. And so we'd like to kind of figure out how do we use mental health programs as a way to reduce jail recidivism. Um, and, and so the way this project went about over the last few years was um, where machine learning was really useful is in trying to understand what are the factors that lead to recidivism? Can we identify uh, people who are likely to go back to jail. Um, and the second piece was that they had limited resources, so they couldn't just give mental health outreach to everyone. So their, their, their resource constraints were, they said, well, we can help a couple hundred people. We can do proactive mental health outreach to a couple hundred people every month. Can you help us identify who we should do this outreach to? And so we work with them to get data from mental health, from criminal, from the jail, from police, from other medical sources, uh, hospitals, emergency rooms, and combine that to one, predict um, who is at risk of coming back to jail. Um, and while that's 
useful, it doesn't really change anything, right? So then the next step is, how do we actually change their outcomes? How do we change and reduce their risk of coming back to jail? And so last a year and you know, a few months ago, it was of June 2019, we started a trial with them, a randomized trial, where we would give them a list of uh, people at high risk of recidivism, and they would go out and start doing mental health outreach programs. Um, and they were doing that for the last, you know, for, for 12 months. Um, and now we're getting that data back, so I don't have results yet, but but we're using that to measure the reduction in recidivism rate. On um, And the second piece that we're testing is what types of people um, we were able to, re the, this intervention work for, um, so that we could then design new interventions people it's not effective for and, and allocate these resources to people who uh, will benefit from that. So that's kind of coupling the machine learning piece of sort of we know how to predict things really well with the social science piece of, of intervening and testing the effectiveness of the interventions and combining that together to build a system that's using data to figure out how do we reduce recidivism, right? And so that theme is going to be, uh, I'll, I'll come, I'll continue to kind of, you know, give you a couple of examples. This is some work, again, we've been doing for a few years in Chicago on reducing lead poisoning of identifying kids at high risk of lead exposure and using that to, to allocate inspection resources to go check for lead hazards and, and remove them before the child is able to be exposed. And in some cases, even before the child, child is born by incorporating it into the electronic medical record system. Um, another depressing, horrible example that's, that's still extremely relevant, this work around police misconduct, um, as, as all of us you know, know at this point, it's uh, policing is also fairly broken in this country. And so this is some work, again, we started in 2015 through the Obama White House on um, building what's called early intervention systems for police departments. And the idea was to be able to identify which police officers are going to be at risk of doing horrible things, um, justified use of force, um, uh, unjustified shootings, unnecessary injuries, and all of the things that we've been hearing about. Um, the idea was, can we identify officers at risk and then can we connect them with, uh, can the police department have interventions such as, you know, uh, it could be training, it could be counseling, it could be uh, desk duty, it could be, you know, uh, other other extreme things. Um, so that system, we, we worked with a few different departments, Charlotte, North Carolina, Nashville, that's implemented there. Um, and, and we're sort of getting data back from them to, to, it's been implemented for about a year or so, so that we're getting data back to evaluate the effectiveness of, of, of those at, at reducing those types of incidents. Um, there's a bunch of other projects in, in around sort of policy that involve compliance, like improving different inspection, inspection programs. So this is some work in to some work in Chile on improving workplace safety to figure out where it should be, which workplaces to inspect uh, to reduce um, safety incidents or housing safety in San Jose or with organization used to be known as EPA in, in this country on compliance with, with hazardous waste disposals or, or Cincinnati on, on, on blight. Um, this was again, some, some work we did a couple of years back with New York City on, um, identifying tenants so they started a new team that was focused on um, uh, identifying tenants who might be harassed by their landlords whether it's sort of rent subsidized uh, or unstabilized units um, and trying to figure out how do we how do we take the resources we have to do outreach which are limited resources and, and focus it on people who are going to have that need in the future um, this is a very different project, this is some work we did with Syracuse um, in, in New York State on water pipes breaking uh, and causing all sorts of you know, um, issues ranging from kind of people not having water to stores not being able to sell things that are cold or and that affects the communities and, and it's also expensive. Uh, and so that the work with them was to identify again which pipes are likely to break in order in some cases to do early you know preventative maintenance but in other cases to coordinate with the roadworks department to figure out if a road is already going to be dug up, can I go a little bit deeper and, and fix some of these pipes? Or if it's high risk of breaking, can I put in sensors, which would be expensive to put everywhere? Can I prioritize 
the placement of those sensors on high risk pipes to make sure that that I can I can um, uh, reduce the risk of, of them um, breaking. So, and then I'll give you sort of one last example. This is some work in Jakarta, um, where you know traffic <laughs> traffic accidents are, are a much 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 bigger deal than, than than let's say the U.S. About a few thousand people die every year, and one of the things that they ended up doing was that in order to deal with that was they, they wanted to figure out what the root causes for these accidents were. So they put in what you know a lot of cities do is put in a bunch of cameras. So they put in about 5,000 cameras in the city and found that they couldn't really do anything with those cameras. Um, and so what we worked with them to help what sort of, you know, would have been fairly standard, you know, let's take standard computer vision tools and, and, and detect different objects and, and figure out sort of things like you know, non-vehicles using roadways and um, um, pedestrians walking through traffic or overloaded motorcycles. But it turns out, you know, when you take the pre-existing trained vision algorithms that they don't have a category for overloaded motorcycles because motorcycles don't come with bags, you know, all over, um, or they don't have a category for food cart vendors. Uh, and even if you sort of apply those tools in London, for, for in the UK, in London, which we did for a different project, the buses don't rec get recognized. So they're very much sort of US centric. So the idea was how do we, how do we adapt some of these tools to recognize these types of, of, um, uh, of objects and then turn that into sort of uh, uh, almost a, you know, basically the idea was to have a spreadsheet of events for the transportation team there so they can look at what types of, of so this, this video that I'm showing is a, is a two way street but you want to, but you have these cars coming in, uh, I don't know, to, to cross in and downstream it causes accidents, right? So the idea is how do we give these analysts the, the, the structured data that they can then use to find root causes for these accidents and then change the policy, whether it needs to be a median in the middle of the street or whether it needs to be other types of, of, of roadblocks in order to, to fix these things, right? So in, in kind of all of these, these, example, or pretty much most of these examples, whether it's lead poisoning or police misconduct or recidivism or pipes breaking, um, um, the, the, in all of these things, you know, unlike a lot of applications we see of machine learning and AI, which is kind of autonomous decisions being made, you know, ads being targeted, movies being recommended, all of these, none of these are autonomous. These are all these collaborative systems where you've got a person making a decision. The person is, is trying to figure out, how do I reduce this person's risk of coming back to jail? How do I reduce this kid's risk of lead poisoning? Um, how do I figure out whether, um, should I do this, should I inspect this facility or this house? It's, it's, a, it, it's a machine learning system or AI system that's, that's recommending to, some, to, to a human what to do. Um, and so a lot of these systems are kind of these collaborative systems. The second thing that they all have in common is they're looking at limited resources that exist inside governments or nonprofits and trying to figure out how best to allocate them. Um, so we've only got resources to go out to outreach for 150 people a month in Johnson County. Or we've only got resources to do, you know, 20 home inspections in Chicago to prevent lead poisoning. We've only got you know enough resources to to dig up so many roads to 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 check for for pipes, um, and the question is how do I best allocate those resources for inspections, for interventions, for different programs? The third piece is all of them have competing, possibly societal goals. Um, you might have a goal of efficiency, which is I want to make sure I help as many people as possible with the limited resources I have. Um, and you want to be effective for those people, but you can't leave behind equity because, again, that's you know, a lot of these, these policies have to be designed with, with equity and, and fairness in mind. And then you have to kind of be able to figure out how do I allocate these resources so that the, the, the system is leading to equity, right? So, so the question really comes up is how do we develop these systems? How do we develop these collaborative um, human AI, human machine learning systems um, that are helping people make decisions, right? They're not autonomously making decisions. They're, they're, they're helping people that lead to fair and equitable outcomes. So that's kind of the, the, the question that, that we're really focused on is how do we develop these types of systems that are collaborative, that are 
um, um, recommending to to often people and experts what what to do or or giving them some extra information that they need in order to make a decision but our goal is not just to 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 sort of do it accurately which you know i'm saying in quotes because in machine learning we sort of have some definition of of accuracy which is generally very poorly defined um it's sort of you know some macro Thing of how many decisions that you get right but but in this case we're really focused on making sure that that they lead to fair and equitable outcomes and the reason i sort of say outcomes is uh, there's been a lot of work over the last few years in in machine learning on um you know this sort of the area called fair ml right so fairness in machine learning and a lot of that is really focused on the the the, the machine learning model in the middle the the tiny little thing that you know um it's been optimized sort of how do we make that fair and 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 the work that we've been focused on is yes it's a kind of useful to make that fair but what's more important is we want the overall system to be fair right and the system involves the world the the, the machine learning model and then the people who are taking actions based on that right so what we've been thinking about is you know how do we even start by defining what fairness or or, or equity means how do we measure um, any sort of biases? How do we understand the root causes? And then how do we reduce the, the bias or improve the fairness? And we know that whatever systems we build will not, that the, that the machine learning systems won't necessarily be completely fair. So how do we mitigate the impact of some of the unfairness? And then how do we monitor and evaluate these systems so that they continue to, to do what, what, we, what we think they're doing? And so the, the first step in, in really thinking about this is really kind of starting with, well, why are all of these, what, where is this bias in inequities coming from in these types of systems? Um, and the biggest reason is, you know, because the world is biased and because the world is biased and because the world is sexist and because the world is, is racist, um, it has, th that's what kind of causes a lot of these biases. It causes the data to be biased and our, a lot of our systems to be biased. And, and so I think that's kind of the, the 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 first piece is like we have a lot of things happening in the world that that that's that's causing this this bias to happen, which then leads to a lot of the data that we end up using having biases, right? And so the obvious ones we we can sort of think about are things like you know sample bias, right? Where if I assume that Twitter is a representative sample of the world, we know that's not correct. Or um, crime data is reported crime data. We don't have accurate. We don't have a system today that exists to collect accurate crime data. We have a reporting a sensor that's 911 and police, and that's clearly biased. Um, so, so a lot of these biases come from there. Then we've got measurement biases because we don't know how, again, all the data we use in our systems are, are really through some sensor, um, whether it's self-reporting sensor, whether it's you know somebody complaining about something sensor uh, or physical sensors. Um, a lot of biases creep in there. The third bias is sort of interesting because it's very, very hard to correct for. The first couple, you can actually try to do some of these things. The third bias is interesting. We're calling the label bias. Think of it as, you know, so, so we've got two types of problems we're often dealing with in, 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 these, in these policy problems. And one is kind of an early warning system problem, which is, um, let's say I'm trying to build a system to, to predict who, which students might not graduate high school on time so that I can connect them with after school programs, connect them with other resources they need in order to graduate, which students need extra support in order to graduate on time. Now, if I'm using historical data to see which students graduate and which students don't, well, that outcome is not something that's, that's absolute. The outcome of a student graduating and not, not graduating is very much a function of what support that they have. Um, did they have the resources? Did they have, you know, what was their home situation? Like how far did they live from school? How much were they moving around? What kind of help did they need? Did the school have a program for them? So it's not as if the student is, you know, destined to not graduate or graduate. All the context of the world, the environment is embedded into that outcome. Um, and, and I can't just use their outcome to sort of predict what would have happened. I don't have a counterfactual for them. Um, and, and that causes a lot of downstream issues. A different type of problem happens 
where a human is is generating some sort of a label, right? So we've seen all sorts of biases in in face recognition and, and other similar things, um, and so the uh, a different uh, you know in the example I was giving around police officers, the the systems that we use to build that it, it takes the, the outcome is you know every time there's a use of force happening or um, weapons discharge or injury, it triggers an investigation. And then the police department has an internal affairs team that does the investigation and judges whether this, uh, that incident was justified or not justified. Now, if that process is totally biased and corrupt, like it is in many departments, the outcomes we get, you know, if, if they never call anything unjustified, our system has no way of, of getting a counterfactual and saying, no, 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 that should have been justified, right? So it requires some data that's relatively reliable. It requires understanding the process of these investigations and the bias and the corruption and who's involved. Um, so that a lot of these issues come from there. Um, and then if, you know, if we can sort of, the next step is when we get to our building the machine learning system, um, often the biggest, one of the biggest source of bias is people who build these systems. We, we sort of take our own biases and, and embed them into these, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. And so I often sort of get this from people where they say, oh, I don't want to use that data source because I think it may be biased, right? So we kind of use our judgment um, to, to decide that. Or we, well, there's a flaw in your, in your develop, what you develop, and that's causing the bias. Or you made some design choices, which I'll go a little bit later um, in the next slide. The last piece is, you know, you can have a perfectly fair machine learning model. You can have perfectly fair data if, if that's possible. But how it's going to be used is going to cause, can cause a lot of downstream biases, right? So for example, you have a perfectly fair model to, uh, again, to, to predict uh, who's at risk of lead poisoning. And you now have to, the next step is to, to call the, 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 the parent and get an appointment for the inspector to go in and check for that hazard. If that outreach program is happening in English, your perfectly fair model is going to result in completely unfair outcomes because everybody who's going to get outreach will only, only people who haven't make an appointment are people who can speak English. Um, or if you're only making calls to people who have, um, you have phone numbers for, right? So there is a very strong interaction between um, your, the model and how it gets used, what actions get taken. And that's why, you know, we're thinking the, the focus has been on thinking about the overall outcomes rather than just making the system fair is you can have a perfectly fair model leading to unfair outcomes and an unfair model when acted on correctly when and which will I'll give you a couple of examples um, in a few minutes can can mitigate the risk of that 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 bias and and, and lead to more equitable outcomes um, so you know just to give an example of kind of how even within sort of this this machine learning pipeline there's so many places bias can creep in right like it often comes from the choice of data sources um, but there are a bunch, of other, a bunch of other places that are not so obvious, right? So most real systems do some sort of um, integrating data, record linkage, for example. They'll take data about uh, people and then combine it with other, other data sources about the same people. And in that matching, that record linkage, we make somewhat arbitrary distinctions about, you know, we get these two records and it says, well, there's a 60% chance they're a match. And we either sort of, we make two types of mistakes, right? We, we miss people uh, we, or we link them together when they're not the same people. And if you sort of look at those errors are not uniform errors, you know, people with long names with lots of consonants uh, next to each other get their names mistyped quite a bit. And that means when you link them, you tend to miss them quite a bit. People with really common names tend to get mislinked together or people who live on similar, you know, street names that are really common or, and so those errors tend to be disparate for different types of people. They're, they're, they're just, you know, they're, they're, and, and that's an, that leads to downstream biases in when we build, you know, those are, that's an extra information about somebody that's not correct, or you missed information about somebody. And that leads to you making predictions about them that could be wrong. Um, same for things like when we do, 
you know, um, fairly, fairly simple things like, you know, dealing with missing values. So if you've got a data, you know, a problem where you have 80% males and 20% females, and you have the height of the female is missing. If you do the naive thing of I'm going to take the mean of everybody and, and, and fill in the missing value for the, for the height of the female, it's going to be dominated by the, 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 the height of the males in the data. And now you're going to make females look more like males, which means your predictions are going to become more skewed towards them. And so again, there are a lot of these pieces where we take these steps pretty early on in our analysis workflow and our pipeline that have downstream implications that we don't often think about. We don't, we don't carry those design choices through to see, well, what's the impact of that? Um, that leads to the whole, 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 whole um, sorts of issues that we have to kind of think about when we're building, building these systems. Um, and let's see, so once we've kind of, you know, the, the other piece there is in, when thinking about bias, one of the things, you know, if, if, if you look at sort of existing literature, what you'll see is people have proposed all sorts of metrics. Like there's all sorts of metrics to measure around bias. And they all sort of generally, they're kind of distributional metrics. If I want to make sure that if I have X resources to allocate, I allocate them equally to different groups that I care about, or I allocate them proportionally to their uh, prevalence in in the population or the, the second type of metrics often look for disparities in errors. So if I'm going to make mistakes, let's say I predicted this kid was at, at risk of lead, lead poisoning and let's say I was wrong. Um, that, that's going to be, you know, um, a false positive, right? So I'm going to either have a false positive error or a false discovery error, or I predicted that this kid is not at risk and I was wrong. Then I'm going to have a, um, uh, you know, it's a false negative error, right? So, so I can sort of, what, what the literature has right now is we have all these different metrics and then we have sort of some um, uh, work that shows, that's good work that shows that, that some of these, you know, we can't achieve all types of these, these, these fairness, right? If I want this, then I can't have that, which, um, which makes a lot of sense because this, the way the data is distributed, I can't necessarily have all of these things. And so, there are two conclusions people have, have, you know, on the policy world, people get to by looking at this. One is they think, oh, if I can't have all types of, if I can't have total fairness, I shouldn't even use machine learning. I should just stop and I should stick with what I'm doing before. Um, and that's, that's risky and scary because it's not as if the current world, the decisions that are being made by people are so good and so fair that, that anything else would be much worse, right? So that's, that's kind of a risk. The other thing is people will sort of start saying, well, I'll just pick one and use it, right? And, and, and neither of them are kind of the right thing to do. Um, and so what we've been working on is ways to kind of bridge this gap between policy and, and sort of fairness in, in machine learning, right? So one of the things we developed um, was this thing called the fairness tree, which sort of helps policymakers or designers of these systems think about what they're going to do with the system that they're building to then get to which metrics should they really care about, right? So I'll just zoom in a little bit. So for example, if I'm doing the, the lead poisoning um, work, right? I'm predicting which kids are at risk. I'm predicting it because I want to help these people by, by, by allocating inspection resources to remove lead. So I have an assistive intervention, which means that a false positive is an opportunity cost, but a false negative is much, much, much worse. So if I miss somebody, um, and if, so let's say my false negative rates for um, uh, black people are much higher than false negative rates for white people, that's bad because I'm missing them at a much, much, much higher rate. So I want to, 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 to get more, um, you know, equal on, on some, some function of false negatives. I'm gonna, not gonna go into the details here, but you can take a look. As opposed to if I have an intervention that's, that's punitive, right? So if I'm, if I'm keeping somebody in jail or I'm doing much more horrible things like predictive policing, um, false positives are much, 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 much worse. Um, and so if I have disparity in false positives for an intervention that could hurt people, I definitely don't want that, right? So, so thinking through sort of, what your use case is, what are you going to, what actions are you going to take? 
helps us come back to what metrics do we optimize for. Um, and so this, this kind of fairness tree kind of, uh, we developed that to, to help people who are making these types of policy decisions and, and implementing these types of systems. Um, another piece was sort of, we, we ended up developed was um, uh, an open source tool for auditing for bias and fairness for these types of predictions. Uh, and the actual analysis underneath it is, is not very complicated. It's just calculating all sorts of different these disparities and showing you where your the disparities are are higher for what what groups that you care about. The the use of it really was that the, that people didn't have that tool uh, something like this. They would just you know do something ad hoc. And so giving people a tool to kind of go through the workflow of of auditing your models before you actually deploy them, um, and it would generate a report that just says your model is biased. It, this group has three times as much um, false positive disparity than, than the reference group. Um, and, and so either you justify it, uh, why it makes sense because of your interventions, or you don't use this model. Um, but the idea is that, that, that governments and, and organizations that are using machine learning models should be auditing their systems before they're, they're allowed to put them in, into production and, and, and use. Um, Let's see. Um, yeah, so so I'll give a couple of examples of sort of case studies on 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 some of this. Um, and so one of them, so the general idea, you know, by looking at sort of this this bias audit tool, is is really thinking about you know today a lot of the the machine learning work that happens is is you know we build a bunch of models, right? and they are either estimating something or classifying or predicting, and we have sort of some performance metric, and often this performance metric is really a proxy for efficiency. We want to get as many things right as possible. Um, and so we look at sort of this, this and say, yeah, you know, I'm going to pick, pick my yellow model. It looks great. And what we're sort of been focused on in that workflow is how to change that workflow to add this, this other dimension of, of bias, right? And so here, this is made up, right? Is yeah, you would have picked the yellow model, but because you only were looking at single dimension, all I'm doing is giving you another dimension, but that hopefully changes the way you you build these systems and, and select which one to use, right? So now it might be that you end up picking this one here, uh, the greenish one, um, because it is much better on bias and not losing too much on performance. Um, and arguably, you know, I, I don't even, I don't like to use the word performance because your performance metric should already be embedding bias and equity it shouldn't be a separate thing but that's kind of the norm right now so i'm kind of separating these two um so here is kind of a practice an actual example you know so here in on a real project this is if we look at kind of bias versus accuracy using gender the the top graph shows the the false discovery rate right so uh, it's it's um a number of false positives um divided by you know, all the ones that you you predicted and you see that there's a bunch of, you know, one is the ideal, right? There's, there's no disparity there. One is the ratio is the same. And you see that you can sort of, you know, you would have sort of, you know, here are two models that are equally accurate, but one of them is much better for fairness than the other. And if you didn't look at the other dimension, you would probably pick one, you wouldn't even see that, that, that they're, they are different. You would probably pick one randomly, right? 50-50, because they're both, you'd say, oh, they're both the same but they're not put the same. Or you might actually go for this one, which gives up a you know, three, 4% inaccuracy um, and, and a little bit better on fairness. Now compare it, or you can, you know, you can kind of go all the way down and lose. Compare that to now, if you cared about a different metric, so this is false positive you know, sort of discovery rate disparity. If you cared about, you know, not having too many false negatives, the disparity in false negatives, so the false emission rate disparity, we don't have that choice. Right? We don't have that trade-off that exists here, where you 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 basically get these models that that are totally unfair, and then eventually they get to they're still really hard to get to be to be fair. So it's sort of it's very much dependent on the problem you're tackling and and the metrics. And so here's a here's an example from a project we were doing um, with a with a hospital system that was looking at you know the, the the way the project started was what they were saying was that there are these guidelines that the so there's um there's a 
organization called U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, and they come up with some, often these different guidelines for um, for people to follow. So one of the guidelines for diabetes screening um, is based on age and BMI. And what's sort of well known at this point in, in that world is that uh, those guidelines are horribly biased. They were developed based on you know a lot of white people, and they miss a lot of non-white people. Um, so they, the, the, the range is very different. And so what they wanted us to do was like, can we develop a better way to, to decide who to screen for type two diabetes? Um, and, and so in this case, what they wanted to know was, can we identify people who are at risk of type, type two diabetes in the next three years? And it was three years because they wanted enough time to, in order to prevent that from happening, you're gonna need some drastic lifestyle changes and it's not a button that you press that fixes it in two months. They wanted you know, a, a couple of years to work with the patients. And so that was kind of the outcome. And what we found was that, we're gonna skip, um, is this is, so in this case, because it's, a, it's an assistive intervention, we're trying to help people, we want to make sure that we don't miss people disproportionately across different age and race and gender groups. And so the metric we care about here is false emission rate. Um, and we want, you know, um, ideally equal false emission rate. So this is what they do today. We looked at this today and we say, hey, they have, th their false emission rate is much higher for 40 plus people over here. Their false emission rate is much higher for Native American, Native Hawaiian. Uh, and it's about the same for male and female. So this is the current state. We can kind of audit their current state uh, and find that and they're biased against you know um, 40 plus people and Native Americans and Native Hawaiians. So what if we now built a machine learning system that was purely focused on being as accurate as possible, which means as efficient as possible. If all the people that identify as I wanna be as correct as possible, regardless of race, age, gender, anything, right? And so we, when we built this global overall model, here's what that model looks like. Right, the, the orange one. What we find is that the orange lines is the current practice, sorry. The blue is the, is the machine learning model. You notice here that the blue line, the blue bars are always lower than the orange bars. So the machine learning model is better for every age group, for every uh, race and for every gender group uh, than the current system. But, it, it's not, you know, that there, there's still disparities there. So it does better for each group, but relative disparities go up, right? So if you look at sort of 40, 40 to 70 here, they're about the same, but in the machine learning model, they're both lower, but for 70 plus people, it's much worse. Um, and so the question here becomes, what do we care more about in, 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 as, a, as a policy? Do we want to do better for everyone? Um, or we want to be more equitable towards everyone. You know, uh, what, what are the trade-offs here? How do we make that decision? And again, that's not a decision that I should be making. It's not a decision that you know any machine learning person should be making. It's a policy decision, a societal decision that we have to decide, what do we care about? What do we want the end result to be? Do we want end result to be everyone is better off, but some people are much better off than others? Do we want the society with, with you know, with, with, what if I, you know, again, it's, it's the average income has gone up and, and income for every, every group has gone up, but the disparities have, have increased as well. Is that, the, is that the world I wanna be in? Or do I wanna be in a world where, where there's more equity, but maybe lower average um, wages? And that's, again, that's a policy and societal question that, that these types of systems are forcing us to, to, to talk about. Because these types of decisions before were very ad hoc and, they were hand wavy and now we need parameters in these systems to put in of what do you want me to optimize for? And so the values that we often not have in connotative discussions about are now being, and we're now being forced to put these values, you know, much more explicit. Right? And so I can sort of go through some of these other things, but I'm gonna to switch to a different um, example. Um, which is some work we've been doing in Los Angeles for the last couple of years with their um, city attorney's office. And they had created um, a new team which was focused on kind of reducing misdemeanor recidivism. So misdemeanors for you know, people who may not be familiar, kind of you know, smaller um, crimes where you, where you 
um, um, you typically sort of go to jail for some time um, and and not long term things. But one of the challenge, you know, just like every other type of 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 criminal justice issue, there's a high rate of of recidivism, and and a lot of it is again because people have other needs, social service needs, other types of other programs that they're not getting, and that's what's leading to to them getting arrested and then put into jail. And so the, the city attorney's office um, came to us and said, look, we the typical process is somebody gets arrested, they get taken to court, um, and we have to show up to kind of to for the case. And we only have about, you know, an hour, two hours to get ready for that case. And 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 what we need is is a much more you know lead time because if we had more time, what we could see is this person who's just being brought to you know to to court for and arrested, you know what they need is connection to this social service program. And so if I had time, what I could do is figure out what service they need, make that connection, and have that be ready in a case file. So if they get arrested and I get called, I have that case file pre prepared that took me a while to prepare, that I can show up to court and and make a case that this is what they need. Um, but we don't have that time. So can you help us build a system that sort of gives us an idea of, you know, um, a set of people who might be uh, coming back in the next month so that we can prepare their case files and have them sitting there. And, and so if they show up, then we, we pick the kit, we make all the connections, we have everything ready so that we can help them. Um, because we don't control the police, but we can control the outcomes. Um, and and so the, the question there was, can you help, you know, if we could help 150 people a month, can you help us build a system that we could use to, to prioritize which 150 to, to prepare these case files for? And sort of what we, what we ended up finding was when we built sort of our first system that was purely optimized for efficiency, um, which is take the system that's most accurate because that's accuracy is basically, I picked 150 people how many of them am I right about? That's, you know, precision is the metric that we use in the top 150, but it's sort of a proxy for efficiency is of all the people I'm gonna intervene with, I wanna be right about as many as possible. When we looked at that, what we found was that, you know, it was in terms of race, we had about equal um, percentages of black and white, but, but a much lower percentage of, of Hispanic people. Um, and so what we then sort of, said, well, well we, have, we have a few different options, right? One way to deal with this disparity is um, to just get more resources. Um, so you're gonna help 150 people, that means that you're not gonna help enough Hispanic people. So why don't you get some extra resources and, and help some additional uh, people in order to balance it. But if you have your current system, here, here's what happens. So let me just skip through some of this actually. Right. So again, so so here's here's what happens in a system that that's not that's sort of not that's purely focused on efficiency, is the Hispanic recidivism rate today is higher than than white recidivism rate, and so if you design a system that's better for white people than for Hispanic people, you help both, but it results in increasing disparity in recidivism rates. So it starts hurting, you know, disproportionately, uh, and 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 it leads to a world where there are huge disparities in recidivism rate. That is the most efficient system, but that's not necessarily the most equitable system. Okay. So then we gave them three options. We said, here's option number one. This system, we our precision or accuracy is, you know, about seventy-two percent, uh, and so if all the people we give you, seventy-two percent are going to come back, and so seventy-two percent of your resources will be allocated towards people who are going to come back. So they'll be, they'll, they'll be efficient. Um, but here's the, here's the outcome, increased disparity. Option number two is we're going to build, we can build something that is um, equally correct for both. So we can, what that results in is equality, um, which is we, and that's about 2% less efficient. So you spend two, the cost of this is 2% extra on top of what you were doing before it's equally accurate for both. So it reduces both equally, but it keeps the disparity, it keeps the status quo disparity. So downstream, you know, through three, four, five years, you've reduced recidivism rate for both white and Hispanic people, 
but it's it's um, it hasn't decreased. It's you've preserved the, the status quo disparity. Um, so then we said, here's option number three. And option number three is we build a system that's better for Hispanic people than white people, um, and the cost is pretty much you know the same as option number two. Um, and, and, and that's an empirical cost, right? To build a system and we calculate its efficiency and the metric. And what that is, is it's doing better. And so that results in reducing the disparities and getting to equity, which is equity in recidivism rate. And so we kind of gave them these three options. Is you have the most efficient option, which is 72.7%. Um, and and that that is much you know that leads to increasing disparity. You have the equality option, which is two percent less efficient, that leads to preserving the status quo. And you've got the the equity option, which leads to equity or equal recidivism rate downstream. Here are the here's the policy menu. Um, here's the cost, and here's the outcome. Um, and you know they they went with option number three. And then there's a, what I'm sort of skipping is, you know, there's a bunch of math and algorithm in the back that says, how do we actually build these systems, right? How do we get in the paper that I, there's a, there's a link to the paper here that you can read to talk about, to learn sort of what the technical pieces were. But the point was really that we had to go from the, the metrics and the bias to the policy menu. And the policy menu had to be focused on the cost and the outcomes. And that's where sort of the policymakers can decide how do we trade them off? What's, you know, how do you decide? Um, and again, that's a policy question that, that we want ideally to be able to, to, to give choices that are sort of, you know, leading to equity so that people have that option rather than saying, here's a machine learning system. It is 72% accurate. Like, well, no, you decided what the metric was um, and that shouldn't be somewhere implicit. It should be very explicitly designed and what you care about. And if you care about equity, then we have to kind of design these systems to, to optimize for, for equity. So I'll kind of end with a couple of more recent projects that we've started where, where we're applying these ideas and testing these. One of the things that we're finding is that what I just meant to mention was that, you know, this, this trade-off between equity and accuracy or fairness and accuracy you, you hear a lot of people sort of talking about this trade-off and we're finding that many of our problems that we're working with, there is no actual empirical evidence that that trade-off exists. Like in this case, the trade-off was fairly minimal. Like with, you know, it, 2% um, uh, it is, is not really a, a large enough number to really think of it as a huge trade-off, right? So one of the things we're doing is applying these ideas to pretty much every project that we're working on. So there's some work that we've started a few months ago that's that's with the state of Pennsylvania here um, to thinking to help them initially reopen the economy, but then now recovering um, from the health and economic impacts while making sure that we can keep equity in mind about how do we do better testing and more equitable testing. Uh, we also have a project going on that we started this summer in Mexico with the Carlos Stem Foundation that's in charge of the electronic vaccination program. Um, to identify children who are at risk of not getting vaccinated so that they can do proactive outreach. Um, and that's where um, COVID has had a huge impact in how they can do outreach, what the vaccination rates are, and they're trying to kind of get ready to, 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 to deal with that. And then the third project that we also started this summer with Code for America, um, where, you know, as you all know, in a, a lot of first time, there have been a lot of first time applicants to social service programs. So, so the SNAP program um, had a lot of new applicants. And so they've, Code for America has a system they've built where people come in through and apply for SNAP benefits. And we're working with them is a lot of these people also have other needs, whether it's childcare needs, um, um, let's say medical needs. And um, what we're doing is using their application data to, to infer if they have other social services needs and proactively connecting them with those programs. And in all of these things, fairness and equity is a primary goal, right? It's not enough to just sort of say, well, we'll help all the kids who, who are easiest to help uh, to get vaccinated and, and leave behind the ones who are harder to help. Who are, um, so how do we design these systems with, with equity? Same for recovery from, you know, we've seen all the, all the 
the, the studies about the COVID impact being done disproportionately on, on poor people and, and you know, um, minority um, and, and, and all of that um, is, you know, we have to kind of design. So anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up last, uh, one second. Right, so, so kind of wrapping up, right? Like we, we've seen that there's a lot of work around on machine learning the, and AI that's giving us ways to design sort of more personalized, tailored, individualized policies that have traditionally been focused on efficiency. How do we help the most number of people with limited resources and have tended to kind of ignore equity? And what we're sort of pushing for is how do we make these systems result in more equitable outcomes? How do we make sure that fairness and equity are treated as primary metrics? It's the metric that matters. And, and how do we make sure that the machine learning model it's not about the machine learning, right? It's about the outcomes. So how do we support those outcomes being fair and equitable through the work that we're doing? Um, and at least our belief is that, you know, we can only do this in collaboration with organizations that are, that are doing this work. Um, and, and so a lot of this, you know, it's, it's these collaborations with governments and nonprofits um, is really a good way to one, get a really rich set of real problems and real people who care about those problems and real data that you can use to tackle them um, but also a way to to make the make this work much more much more policy relevant much more um, practically relevant so yeah um we we have time i think we have some time for questions um i can take some from the q a um but also feel other people feel free to jump in and, and put so more questions. Just, thanks so much for the excellent presentation. I very much enjoyed it and very informative. Uh, we do have two questions on the Q and A, and maybe I can I can combine them. One is by Eric Neeling, and the question is, does achieving a fair and out, uh, equitable outcome still falls with the classical reward maximization paradigm? Can you address that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an it's a it's a sort of Feel like it's an easy thing to say oh it just it's just reward maximization i think the hard part here is that the the reward function is not explicitly provided to us up front right so it's it's sort of some consensus building because right now a lot of our 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 mm -hmm. metrics are we can treat as yes yet another uh, metric and, and you can sort of do some sort of, you know, multi-objective -object optimization. Sure. But I think for equity type things that there, there is sort of a little bit more, like we don't know enough to figure out how to even elicit those, those metrics, um, how to get consensus on those metrics. And what is the distribution of people, you know, who would we satisfy if we achieve this version of equity versus that version of equity? So I think at a high level, yes, the, but I think when you get to the practical and you actually try to build a system that does that, it becomes much more nuanced than saying, you know, my metric is AUC and, and I can just calculate that and there's no controversy around it. So that's, that's a little bit, it's, it's a little bit requires more interactions with people and, and understanding the context. Yeah, and that goes down to us uh, not knowing yet how to accurately quantify social outcomes, right? So you can put them with the proper weights and see that. So judgment and policy and, and, and some kind of back and forth, I would say it's required, right? Yeah, and I think we have so, to kind of- uh, Let me our... go to the second question. Yeah, 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 yeah go, no, no. Go, go ahead. ahead. Please, please go ahead. No, no, uh, that's, that's fine. I'll take the second question. The second... Which is... How do you know when you need to update your prediction model? Because the yeah, world is you, you start with a good model that is not good anymore. When do you know? <laughs> when do you make the intervention? Yeah. How do you no, know when? It, it, that's something we've been spending a lot of time on. And again, I think the only way to know this is, is to have access to the live system, right? So it's kind of my point on this has this work has to be done in collaboration with, with organizations who are using this work. It can't be done in isolation in a lab because your, your data never, you, if, as soon as you act on things, the world changes. Even if nothing else changes, your actions change the world. And I, I mean, again, there's a lot of work in this area on sort of how, how things, you know, 
temporal drift and distribution shifts and all these things. What we're finding with, with bias is we spend a lot of time in machine learning trying to generalize our, met, you know, our systems over time. What we actually found was that if we don't, if we sort of generalize for um, accuracy, precision, AUC, um, it doesn't, that generalization doesn't, doesn't translate to bias generalization. So what we did was we built systems and said, okay, at time T, let's optimize for um, equal disparities. We go to time T plus one and it's, it was all over. So we don't actually know how to generalize for bias. The second piece is that, you know, one of the things we can do if we, is when we're building these systems, we can actually test them um, at least over, over historical data to see how long can they, can they go on without getting updated. Right? So let's say I build a system um, and I test it on data from beginning of 2019. And then I simulate how far I can go one month, two month, three month until I retrain. I can see the performance degrading, at least on historical data. So it gives me some sort of a, a, a bound on how much can I go on for? So every project that we do, that's you know, because we hand over these projects to these organizations, we have to give them some guidance on how long can you go on without updating? Sometimes it's two, three weeks, sometimes it's two, three months, and sometimes it can go on for a year, but that depends on how much the world is changing. So what we've done is kind of, and I think the best way to do it is to actually, in your model selection process, simulate that behavior to say, I know when I'm building a model, this model is more robust this model is less robust. It can, it can you know, diverge more. Um, this model might be more accurate and this model might be more interpretable. This model might be more fair. So now you have different trade-offs. If, if, I, if I want to dig in for, for a moment there, I mean, there is one question to say, to predict ahead of time, how long my model is gonna be good. But uh, the other, and that's obviously difficult, depends on so many things. The other is, do we have robust statistical tests to tell us when the model has gone bad? I mean, uh, yes, me, but me, bad uh, is a... Ray, let, me, let me add to his question before you take... I mean, so something that you've been saying throughout really struck me. I mean, is the problem that in so much of machine learning, sort of an implicit human model is a homo economicus where there is a, you know, there is something to be optimized and certainly it's convenient. But have we sort of gone overboard just because it has been convenient? Uh, have we, and, and what you're arguing for is really maybe, a, you know, certainly the psychologists don't believe in the homo economicus and so on. So what, 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 tell me a little bit about where you stand on uh, sort of boundary rationality and some of those other, other approaches to, to... No, I mean, that's, so, so I was on a panel last, last weekend and one of the people, you know, one of the things we were talking about uh, was right now we, our machine learning models model individual predictions or individual um, assessments, right? So you, somebody labels something. What if instead we thought about modeling people, right? So if, if, if you might say, well, this person, so, you know, it's like having a committee, right? And, and our models are really looking at, at, a, at a committee level predictions. And so it's sort of saying, well, this person would have said these things, and this person would have said these things. And if these are systems that we're thinking of as really helping humans make decisions, it's like asking a committee for input and then making a decision. So there's several different things people are doing, right? There's some work um, that David Parks is doing, which is, you know, we shouldn't be at Harvard, which is we shouldn't be making predictions. The human doesn't need prediction. The human needs input in order to make a decision. Uh, and so what inputs do we provide them? I think a lot of machine learning has become really this, you know, optimizing over something you know, you have a metric, you have some data, you have a test set, you can run your for loops until you get improved metric performance on this data set. And, and that has, you know, limited value, but I think for these more real complex problems, we do need to think about, you know, we don't have a static data set. We don't have labels that we can trust. We don't have a metric. 
that limits the number of people who can work on it, right? Because it's, it's hard to, to give access to all of this to everyone. So I think that's one thing we have to figure out as a field is how do we give access to people, to these types of problems, to people um, and to the data and to a live system that's changing in order to even test anything, right? Um, but I think, I think that's, we have to move there if we think we're gonna have actual practical impact that's the way to have practical impact um, is, is to be part of that, that loop. But, but it, it, it is, you know, we don't want to get to the point where you have three people who have privileged access to this and only those three people can do this and nobody else. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, that's a longer conversation, but, but certainly it's one that we need to have as a field. Thank you, Raid. Uh, thank you so much for an, um, a very enlightened conversation. I really appreciate it and I'm sure the audience does too. So I would like to thank you for, uh, for being with us today and I would like to thank the audience and uh, remind you all to join us one week from today, which believe it or not, we're talking about prediction, solving prediction problems, uh, health outcomes in and, uh, health related uh, you know, issues like from heart attacks to COVID-19 by professors Mulay Nathan and Norben Weyer. So I hope to see you next week. And again, Raid, thank you so much thank you. for this presentation. Thanks.